Hey, GovCon Giants family, your host, Eric Coffey here, and today's podcast guest on GovCon Giants podcast that you can find on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Google Play, Google Music, everywhere that you enjoy your podcast listening. Today's podcast guest, Patrick Heffler. Patrick is an incredible husband. He's an incredible father. He's got four beautiful kids. We showcase that today. He talks about his kids. He talks about his family. He's so proud of what they're doing and his accomplishments. And then we start talking about his business and his aspirations and how he got started and how he remembers his father waking him up on Saturdays to go and work and how he took what was a one person company, $300,000 in revenues just before he got into the 8A program and he grew that business out 10 thousand percent. That's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. Plus, much more. Stay tuned for this upcoming episode with Patrick Heffler. My name is Patrick Heffler. I'm the president of the Heffler Contracting Group. Um, we're a 8A hub zone contractor and um, based in San Diego, California. We have uh, three offices, one in Hesperia, which is northern uh, I would say about three hours north of, of San Diego and another one um, near Vandenberg Air Force Base that we just opened up recently. Okay. Been, been in the business all my life, quite honestly. Have um, grew up in the business. My dad was a contractor. And the funny thing is I, I learned so much from my father. He, he taught me what hard work was all about. He taught me... Um, how, how great it is to love what you do and how going to work every day really is not a job. It's, it's enjoying what you do in life and how you can contribute as a family member, as, as a dad and show your kids how to work. And I, I thought that was, it was, it felt very comfortable being in construction. I um, went to St. Augustine high school in San Diego and it is an all boys school. Um, I met my wife who's a high school sweetheart she went to the, the sister school, which is Our Lady of Peace in San Diego. Um, my sons have, uh, I have three, three to four kids, mm -hmm. twins that are 22. One is um, now a football coach at Concordia University in Wisconsin. His mm -hmm. name is Andrew. And my daughter is Caitlin. Mm -hmm. She is at the University of Alabama. Yeah. And she's going to be a, news, uh, a sports broadcaster. Yes. And she, I'll, I'll put a little plug in for her, 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 <laughs> her um, podcast. great, great, great podcast is called Bama Network. Yeah. And she's doing extremely well. I'm very proud of her. My son just um, uh, earned a uh, scholarship to Cal Poly University. He'll be playing football. That's my middle son. His name is Connor. And Justin is going to be attending St. Augustine High School for the first time as a freshman um, come in the next couple months. So um, that's how my life is. And I basically have a great, great family life with my kids and, and we're very active. Um, as a businessman though, I started in 1991. And all through high school, all through uh, college, I worked. I worked on the weekends, worked in the summers. Can, and I, can, I, can I stop you real quick? Um, I just, I just don't wanna miss the point. We talked about your father. Uh, your father seemed, from what I read about him, uh, he, he considered helping others as his life's greatest work. That is correct. Right. That is correct. And Amazing. it seemed like he was a pillar of a community. Yes. Um, my dad, Clifford Heffler, mm -hmm. um, was an amazing man. Amazing man in all aspects. He, uh, he was tough. I'll, I'll be tell you that. But the, the toughness made him so great. It, it, he, he was the kind of guy that you'd always could rely on. He was an AA member and he was longest living clean AA member in San Diego when he passed. And that was 65 years sober. And I'm very proud of that because a lot of, a lot of people in society have, have issues and things right. that they're, they're right. struggling with right. monkeys on their back. And that was his monkey. And um, that made him strong. That made him strong. Oh my he, god! He was, no, keep talking. You just you just said something that was perfect. Oh my goodness! Keep going. And he he um he went out of his way to help people. Out of, absolutely out of his way to help people. Um, he looked at every every challenge that he had in life as an opportunity to be good. 
and that's what made him so great. He really worked very hard, but he enjoyed what he did. But he really worked on pre on people as well. Everybody around him succeeded in a lot of different ways. He um, was very inspirational to all that it experienced him. Like I said, sixty five years sober is a completely incredible feat. Right, and that's the oldest living in San Diego. And um, when he passed, he passed very peacefully and with a, a room full of about a thousand people going to his funeral of all the people he's touched in his life. And it was all because of hard work and honesty and integrity. And that he tried to spill over, spill over to his, his children, my sister and my brother and myself. Um, when it came to giving, giving to people, he was um, the most generous man I've ever met. And when, when that came, when, when he was passing, it was very difficult for me, but it was the best two weeks of my life because I, I got the opportunity to spend two weeks with my dad. He, was, he suffered from uh, pancreatic cancer and I had to change his diapers. He was so helpless and I've never experienced a man that was so strong, but so helpless at the same time. And it was amazing. And it was the greatest, probably the greatest two weeks of my life because I really got to understand my dad as a person. He had no regrets. He had, he, the only regret he had is he could, if he could do more for people. And um, the people that came to visit him was amazing. And I, I try to bring that over to my business. And, and it, it's very difficult at times because it, it's a very tough business, the kind of construction business, contracting business. Right. But what, what sets good companies from the bad, I would say, is integrity. And I think that's that's where Heffler Heffler is as a culture here of that, and that's what's enticing. You know, it's interesting. Um, one of the questions that I had for you was exactly that: Where are some of the, the principles that your dad uh, taught you that you carried on um, into your personal life with your family that you want to to, to share and convey? I, well, I got a, I got a funny story about my dad. Um, he was. Um, really grew up in the depression, great depression. He, he was, uh, I think, 11 years old during the time. And he was on the streets the whole time. Um, and the, the funny thing about that is, is that that struggle made him who he was today. And I think, think that's where he, he, he always remembered where he came from. He always remembered how he came from. And I believe that's where it comes across with Hepler Company. We always remember where we came from as a small company. We're still a small company, right? But we're 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 doing things that are that are, I think, very impressive in, in our in our um, industry. Um, how it came across is one of the things my dad taught me is that you always do more than you're expected to do, mm -hmm. and that's what's very key in when it comes to construction and working with the government. The government has their priorities; they have their interests; they have their missions to support our troops or they're the federal um, agencies that are associated with that. But they're, they're only interested in results. If we can exceed those, um, those in uh, their expectations in every aspect, in the integrity, price, quality, schedule, that's what our goal is. And that's what my dad always instilled in me. Always do more than you're, you're asked. Always. Not for, not for profit reasons for your own reasons. So you feel good about every project you do, you, you finish. And that's what sort of catapults us from one project to the next. One, one of the, one of the things that, um, one of the things that I love about federal contracting and the eight a program um, specifically is that you're, you're only as good as your last project. Like we just talked about Eric. Right. 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 But in our case, in our case, that's what markets our company. Mm -hmm. Our past performance is what catapults us into two contracts, right. three contracts. Right. And those two contracts, those contracting officers start saying, who's Heffler? How did they perform? How did they do? What was their, what was their pricing schedule like? What was their integrity? What was their safety program? What were their personnel or management team like? They were, they're excellent. So those are the things that make a difference. Um, being men of your people of your word is very important as well. So 
No, that's that's a, that's a great start. Now you said that you always worked. You worked at high school. Yes, my dad. Um, he he was a, he's he's a good guy, <laughs> but, he, uh, but he was tough. So uh, some of the things he we used to work, I used to go work. Your dad was in the Navy. Yes, he was okay. in the Navy. So you're a Navy he was, uh, kid. He was a he wasn't a pilot. He was a pilot mechanic. Okay. Um, so he'd work on the planes, the Corsairs. He'd work on the Corsairs in the Navy on the ship. But Patrick, those Navy men from back in those days were tough, man. Oh, dude. I haven't met a, a single uh, person uh, in that generation that they weren't they weren't like tough. It's man. amazing. Those were it's those amazing. men were, uh, yeah, they were and so different the breed. The funny story is um, he he. One of his first contracts as a contractor okay. was to dig out a basement out of a house, a complete basement, okay. with no with no with no equipment. So he did it by hand, and <laughs> he did it by himself. <laughs> and I I, I I said, Dad, how how do you how did you do that? He goes, just took me a couple of weeks. I was good. <laughs> Made thirty eight dollars. And I, I I I look at that funny because he looked at. Hey, not a lot of people would do that today. No. It would be very no. difficult. Yeah, no. But he, there, he was tough. So on the weekends, he, we would work on the weekends. And he'd get me out of bed, 5 o'clock in the morning, crack a dawn, take me to donuts. That was my – and he'd put me in the ditches digging all, all, all day long. And literally digging. Then I graduated from that point and started able to – he let me use a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and then from that point, he, was, he gave me actually a piece of equipment to learn how to operate. So I learned from the, from the bottom. And I learned working side by side by, with people that work hard. I understand the work ethic. I understand what's involved. And um, he, would, he would work me on the weekends, and, and I didn't argue. I, I loved it. You know, I'm sure also that in working construction, because, again, I've come from a construction background, you probably work with all types of people. Oh, Yes. Because construction, we bring, we bring out all the people coming to construction, right? Oh um, yeah, we bring we bring them all. <laughs> we bring them all, and, <laughs> and from all different states and all different backgrounds, nationalities, backgrounds. Yeah, whatever. so and I'm it sure was, it was hard. It was no, awesome. I mean it's just just honestly because people always I, I tell people look look listen, you know I'm not a I consider myself a tough guy, and for me I didn't like yelling at people and fighting with people. And, and, and what I found in the construction industry was that you did a lot of yelling and fighting and screaming. And it was just oh, yeah. for me, being in the field. Now, the, the, obviously, the personnel in the office was a different caliber. Yeah. Uh, but the guys in the field and, and running crews was just not, a, not my forte. Yeah, it, it was. It, and, and that was my contribution to my parents. And um, it helped them. Um, it was what I could what give a, give a little bit back to my parents and my dad. And, um, but I enjoyed it quite honestly. I mean, we crack of dawn, we'd be driving to projects and I, I had the best conversations with my dad at that time. Wow. And it really wasn't about work. It was just yeah. about being a man. Right. right. And what, what needed to be, needed to be done. And, um, from, from there, I, um, the funny thing is, is I used to play football. I, I know. played at so my high school. I played at USD. And during high school, we have games on Friday nights. But my dad would still wake me up at five in the morning to go to go to work the next day, even considering how sore and tired I was. And I didn't mind it, quite honestly. I didn't mind it. And if I if we celebrated a little bit too much after a game at, in high school, um, you know how teenagers are sometimes after football games. Um, and I get in. My my dad's pretty liberal about getting getting in anytime you want it, but make sure you're ready to go at five o'clock in the morning. So one one story is I, I was cracked. I was cruising on in about three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. I had something to eat down in the kitchen. Grabs my stuff. He goes, "Let's go." Didn't say a word except "Let's go to work." Let's go to work. That was his way of saying, you know, he got responsibilities. You gotta you gotta take care of those. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um, argue with what you did last night or why you're so late. So it, it, was, it was that's he had he had very common sense with all about it, a lot of things. Love it. I love it. And then at USD, same thing. I, I was working on the weekends. I was helping them during the week because my schedule is a little bit more flexible. Um, and I learned a lot. I graduated from working in the field to equipment operator to concrete finisher to, uh, to also an estimator. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had a pretty good background. My parents 
thought I had a pretty darn good background on um, in numbers with numbers. And so I started estimating and I was doing that while going to school. And that's sort of my background, estimating. I studied um, economics at USD and, um, and, but I, my, my dad was more on the civil side of, of civil engineering. So I really understood the civil side of construction. I understand all the site work, all the utilities, everything associated with that. Um, at the end of USD, my parents, my, 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 my brother um, suddenly passed away. And, um, and that was a tough time for my parents. And they wanted to stop, get out of the business. And so I, I basically purchased portion of the, uh, the company from my, I guess my dad's license from him at that time. Um, so, you know, um, he didn't give it to me. He made me purchase it. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's how it started with me. Is that 1991? 1991. Okay. Cause I had on here 81, 56. I had different dates. So. Well, 1990, 1956 was when my, my father originally started his company. Gotcha. That's when he got his contractor's license. Okay. So and then 1991 after, is when you purchased it. When I actually purchased it and, and really started taking over. That's my, my brother died about a year and a half before that. Okay. Okay. All right. So now you purchase it and roughly, you know, when you purchased it, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it was still like a mom and pop business or was it, was it, had, had you grown, had he built it up to something, you know, you know, I uh, know you, you know what? Yeah. It was sort of in the, I'm going to be honest with you, it was sort of in the decline because my, my brother was going through a lot of struggles at the time. And my dad, you know, his background and being in, being in um, AA for so long, he, he, my brother had some issues that he had that he was struggling with. And my dad couldn't, couldn't figure out a way to help him. He couldn't not, not, not get that way. And I love my brother to death and everybody loved him. Uh, it just, he had some issues that he, he couldn't, he was struggling with. And, um, it tore my dad apart. It was like probably his, his, his toughest struggle in his life that he really couldn't get past. And, um, so when my, my brother passed, it really devastated our family, devastated my, my mom and my dad quite often, quite, quite a bit. And, um, I said, dad, I know you, at that time they were not really fit to continue working. They didn't want to work. They, they, they had, they had some, some success with their company and they did, did well. They saved their money like most of that generation does. Yeah. And um, so they had a lot of savings and they were, they were fine. I said, well, I, I'd like to take over the business. He goes, well, you can buy my license and then it's all up to you. And that's what he, that's what he did. And he, he didn't, didn't give me anything, didn't give me any equipment, didn't give me anything. He sold all his stuff and he just said, go ahead. My he first contract. Equipment. He gave you no equipment. No. No nothing. trucks, nothing. Nothing. All had all had to be all had to be brought in. Um, I my first piece of equipment. Oh, actually, no. He did give me one piece of equipment, but it didn't run. <laughs> so it, it, it was it was a piece of junk. Right, look, I just want to be clear for, for, for Dad, if you're watching, he did give me one yes. piece of equipment. Yeah, <laughs> it just didn't and run. He goes, maybe you can trade it in for something, Pat. Um, but at that point, um, my first contract was a twenty-nine thousand dollar contract. At um, well, it was, a, it was a service contract, and then the one my first real contract with was with the um, San Diego Office of Education, and it was a parking lot expansion project. And um, that was my first project. That's funny because you're still doing parking lot expansions. Yes, we are. <laughs> I saw that recently on one of your profiles. You're still doing parking lot expansions. Yeah. We still do that. We still now we build buildings and do a lot of other things. How? That's thank you for that. Uh, that was a great intro. Excellent. Um, you know, because a lot of times people they talk about work ethic and they talk about um, you know what it takes and and then it's funny because you mentioned the monkey on your back. Now I I forgot what context we referenced it, but um, hold on, let me show you something. I'm going to show you this real quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, I, I was looking for that when you made that, that comment about the book here on your back. And, and the reason why is because uh, a friend of mine who's a successful business person today, 
he said, if you can figure out how to get that monkey off your back, you've made it, right? And get past all of those things, he says, you know, you will start finding yourself on the path of being successful. So when you made the comment about the monkey on your back, it just reminded me. And again, like, I think we were referencing like the, the AA program, I think at the time, yeah. but it's, it's, it's the same difference. Whatever it is that's stopping you or preventing you or, or, or impeding you from being able to, to do your life's greatest work. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. That's um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I had to bring that up. I was looking for it the whole time. Uh, I was like, I had to find that picture because I'm actually going to make a <laughs> post about it. Uh, just because <laughs> it, a lot of the truths, a lot of the, like what you said about your dad, about doing more um, than you get paid for and, and living a life of service. All, those are all like old adages that are timeless. They are. And they work. And they work. It doesn't matter where, when you're, where, where, what time of frame you work to live in. Everything works that way. The good, strong values of that, of, of that generation, in my opinion. Um, but the monkey on the back is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great analogy because it's, everybody has them. Right. It doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter. Doesn't who matter who you are. And, yeah. and it just, it just, if you can, if you can contain that and, and be able to control that and be able to direct it in a positive way, it, it tends to help you in the future, in my opinion. No, that's great. So at what point did you, so you started off and you worked with, you know, the $29,000 contract and then you worked with San Diego. At what point did you start looking at the federal arena? It was not until um, 2009, quite honestly. Wow. I was doing capital improvements for a very long time, which is local government municipality work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the problem with local government municipality work is we always had a great, we had always had a great, um, I would say a great, not only uh, had great integrity, but it had a great um, relationships with a lot of these in um, the city of San Diego, the counties, the Caltrans, all these different municipalities. Right. But the thing about those municipalities is it's all, it's all based upon low bid. Right. It's not based upon your reputation. So they might be able to give, give you a bad boy, bad boy and tap you on the shoulder. Hey, we really like you, but no, we, we can't, it's, it's gotta be fair and open when it comes to some of these, which is, I understand because you're dealing with taxpayer money. Um, but, but the problem is, is the, what ends up happening is they, we get a lot of, a lot of contracts that are either under bid or, or going to, going to contractors that don't have that type of reputation or not looking for the best interest of the client. And um, so what I did is I said, you know what? The, the, the economy hit me really bad in 2008 and 2009. Like it was devastating. It, yeah, it was absolutely devastating. I was going from a bidding against four contractors to bid, bidding against 28 contractors. And I didn't get a project for three years, Aaron, three years. It was devastating. How did you so, survive? selling a piece of equipment a week <laughs> or a month. <laughs> and uh, that's honestly, that's what I did. No, I, no. That's how I survived. I sold off my assets slowly to keep things going. I kept, kept all my employees up to the last minute and then had to just, just wait until the economy changed. Hmm. Um, at that time, the housing market was, it was in the tank. The credit market was in the tank. The construction market was in the tank. So it was sort of a perfect storm. And, and at the same time, I was trying to figure out a way to get my kids in school and go and give them the opportunity and the, and the dreams that I had in high right. school because right. Saints and OLP are private schools. And I, I wanted to give them that opportunity. I don't, I didn't want anything that I was doing to take away from what they're trying to do in their life. I wanted right. to, to get this opportunity my dad gave me and my mom gave me. And, um, so I struggled. And how I struggled was I struggled with, okay, what, what can I do to show my kids how to get out of a problem such as this? Because my dad showed me. So I fought and I fought and I figured out, I said, Hey, what's going to give me a competitive advantage over the other contractors? What's going to, what, how can I utilize my ability to um, do, do good work show integrity, not be a change order contractor and, and, and provide that to, to the client. 
the 8A program was the solution. And um, not that the 8A program is a free ticket in any, in any aspect. It just gives you, it just gives you the, instead of a cold call, it gives you a warm call when it gets you, when you talk to a client. They actually, that's just a, a vehicle that they can use to help you get into contracts. But you have to do all the work. So the, the thing about my 8A is I, I went to it no, knowing construction and I knew how to run a business. So I had that advantage, quite honestly. Right. But I, what I didn't have the advantage was is how the, how the federal market worked and how, how was it, how, how, it, how did it maneuver in it successfully during a short period of time. The window of 8A program is nine years. So the 8A um, gave us the, the, the warm call in, in lieu of the cold call. But I still had to figure out how to maneuver through the, the program. So what I did is I went and interviewed, uh, I think it was 18 past and present 8A contractors. And I, I basically came, went to them and I said, okay, if you had the opportunity to have, an 8A, have your 8A today, what would you have done differently? And what would you have, um, what would you try to accomplish? Every single one of them that was successful said, I would have stayed in the programs, the max, the jocks, not rely on sole source contracts. Mm -hmm. The reason why is sole source are taking care of a need of a particular base, mm -hmm. which is great. It's, it's you're getting revenue, but the long-term programs give you long-term viability within the program. It, in a sense, it extends your ability to be an 8A. Right. Um, so the companies that were successful were massive companies, big companies. Right. And, I, I, and they're, they're very good companies, and they're still viable in federal construction today. Right. The ones right. that were not, I don't see them around. Right. The, ones that, the ones that lived off a of sole source. Sole source, source, or lived off the low-hanging fruit, let's right. call it. Right, right. There's really no low hanging fruit with federal federal contracting. There might be, I mean, you can't take it that way when you're in the ADA right, program, right. yeah, because it's going to die die on the uh, on the branch very very quickly. Um, because it's if you rely on that, the government understands that you're relying on that. If you're not, see, the whole point, purpose of the ADA program is it's a business development program. They're trying to give you the opportunity to become a business that's going to bring a lot of employment to, to, to the industry. Right. They want you to become that large business employer. That's what they would like. What made you decide to interview 18 8A companies? Because I, I'm a pretty um, analytical person, quite honestly. And when I get into something, I really look in, look at everything, look at every aspect. How can I, how can I succeed in it? What's, what's, what are people doing that works? What are people doing that do, don't work? Um, so I, I really spend a lot of time doing my research on things. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I had a lot of time on my hand, Eric. I, I, wasn't, I didn't have any contracts. And, and I, I, was, okay. I was submitting. Very valid, I was submitting, <laughs> Very valid I was, point. I like that. I submitted my, my 8A application. It took me 18 months to get it. Similar situ situations that, that people well, have today. Right. Well, it's very difficult. Same situation. Right. It's a very difficult process. And um, so I had some time on my hand. Okay. I know, but, but still, I, I, I've never heard of that before. What's that? That anyone sat down and actually interviewed 8 eight companies. I've never heard of that. It's, it's a, it's a, I would. No, it, it makes total I would sense. It, to it makes absolute 100%. I mean, like if people did more of that, I think I would be out of a job, <laughs> which Let again, me tell you what, my goal is to put myself out of a job by helping and training people and teaching them how these things work. Right. So I'd like to, to work myself out of a job. I just, there are so many people out here that have the 8A certification that have no idea how to use it. They don't even know why they got it. Someone told them about it. Right. And they go into it completely blind, not knowing the program, not knowing how to leverage the program, how it's supposed to work. What is it supposed to do for them? Mm -hmm. What I, I didn't want to waste time. I, I wanted the day I got the, my 8A certification, which I remember it was outside of um, a little coffee shop where I was picking up my daughter from school. 
and I, I was been waiting on it and waiting on it and waiting on it. But prior to that, I would say, I'm not going to waste one day on the NDA day program. Not one, not one, because you waste a day, you're never going to get that back. Never. And I didn't. And I said, as soon as I get certified, I'm going to, I'm going to be ready to go. I'm going to be ready to go. I owe that to my family. I owe that to my future employees or people that are going to be working for bringing Heffler company to fruition. And, um, I, I, I was outside that coffee shop. I got that email after 18 months. I freaking cried. <laughs> I, I was, I was so happy because I, 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 I felt somebody gave me a chance. My dad's looking down on me right. and he said, Hey, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna let. I'm gonna let's see what you can do with it. And so when I in, in, interviewed these 18 contractors, it was it was it was serious. I, w I was going in there for a particular reason. What is it? And and you'll find a lot of 8 a contractors are willing to give back. They are willing to give back, and um, they're willing to help any a lot of contractors out. Um, how, did how did you find and, that 18? Just through small business. And names. I knew. Okay. I knew of contra contractors, and I. Um, I went. Like I said, I went for the biggest ones and even the smaller ones. And um, I just went through SBA um, search. Right. My SBA person. I was. I was actually dealing with gave me some names as well. Okay. And I asked her, Hey, can you give me some successful ones and some not successful ones, or ones that maybe didn't take the the program to its fullest extent? So I did that, and. Um, but what I did find out was the con contractors that were just worried about the low hanging fruit, just the one contract, one contract, living by contract, contract, they didn't last. The ones that had a long term goal on the programs, they lasted. And, and they're still in business today. Um, but so as a company, Heffler Contracting, we, take, we take, took all that, and I struggled as an 8A, quite honestly, for the first two years. Not, not in a, in a revenue standpoint, I would say. I wanted to, I know what, I knew what I needed to do. I needed to bring in people to help me, smarter people than myself. That's what I needed. And I needed people, uh, uh, needed to use the leverage, their abilities to build the company. And so that's what I did. I, I hired three senior project managers and I, we, we, we went after it. We got after it quick, and um, each of them had a particular specialty. Um, my, the first one is Mike Flood, mm -hmm. who understood all the desert air bases. He he worked in the desert forever, and a lot of the projects out there, Twenty Nine Palms, China Lake, uh, Port Irwin, uh, for, uh, just everything that's out there. Barstow, he understood that market. Edwards Air Force Base, NASA. He understood that market and I knew as a federal contractor, I had to not have a single, I couldn't rely on just contracts in San Diego. I had to rely on multiple bases because multiple bases get their funding at different times. Sometimes they, Barstool will not get any funding this year. Maybe they'll get funding next year. So I had to be, I had to move around, um, be able to be um, liquid and move around that. Then I said I needed a, a really strong and smart operations manager, and that new construction, new federal contract, Jesse Tovar, a great man, ex Marine, and he, he he and I built the infrastructure of the company. That means all the tech, technology, all the structure of uh, protocols, everything associated with the business. We we designed it together. Obviously, he did a lot more because he's a lot smarter than I. But um, but he he did he did a, he did an incredible job, um, and we're using his his infrastructure today. Um, then I said, okay, I, I don't want to have any gaps in my backlog when it comes to work, none whatsoever. I had a background of estimating, but I had to market my company. I had to go do my capability presentations. I had to meet clients. I had to meet the government, introduce myself, get my feet out there, and I I it to balance both of them to estimate and do a good job marketing your company and selling yourself. It was very difficult. So I hired a gentleman that had 40 years experience in program management and estimating Carl Kastner. He has 
been extremely, extremely successful at what he does because I give him the leeway. I give him the, I give Jesse, I give Mike, and I give Carl all the binding authority they need to perform. And they trust me to do my job, which is to market the company and keep us in the program, keep us financed, keep us going. And the day we started in the 8A program, I had myself and one other employee. Today we have 96 employees. I was going to ask that question. I was, I was going to ask them yeah. because what it sounded like to me that she's built it from, you know, from the ground up again, basic your business. Completely ground up. And, um, and it was, it was ground up, but we had knowledge. We had some knowledge and right. we, we did made some right moves. No, obviously you had been in business before and you had some success in the past. And so you, right. you weren't coming into uh, the business as, as green as they like to say, right? right? Um, you had business experience, but you just had to start over right from, and have zero. a totally different mentality. Yeah, total, total different outlook on it when it comes to federal contract because it is different. It is different. No, congratulations. Um, you started off with the capital work, and, and, I, and I, 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 I don't know if you've ever heard any of my podcasts, but man, let me tell you, a lot of the things that you say echo things that I've shared in the past. Um, you know, I did you know, work in Miami Dade County, and I just. I never saw anyone really become successful uh, at the county level. You know, they made money and they survived, but they didn't, like you said, they weren't like in the terms of the federal arena where people today still blossom and thrive even beyond those programs, right? There's still large organizations. I never saw that at the city level. I didn't have those examples. Uh, You know, there's, there's a few quite honestly, but there's a few that take, take it. They have it there. They're in, other footprints besides San Diego. They have other counties. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're reliant on one municipality or one client, that's your total downfall. That's why 8A program actually forces you to have multiple clients, forces you to have 8A work and non-8A work because they realize that if you're, if you're dominant in one market or one client and something happens to that client, that, that could be your business. And that's what that's what happened to me, quite honestly, in 2008. All music, all municipality work. Once the municipality work shut down, I had no, no nowhere to go, and um, and that's what happened. So now the way we're diversified now is that we're in several different U.S. U.S. ACE, NAFAC, DHS, NASA. Um, Department of Interior, we, we do a lot of work with all the agencies. And not only in San Diego, we have them all, we're, we're doing projects in, in Hill Air Force Base, Nevada, uh, Arizona, and we have projects also up, up in Vandenberg, in Washington. So we, we, we're pretty diversified. We try to go where the work is needed. And, go, and, and our, a lot of our, our managers on these projects are, are willing to do that. And that's also a, an obstacle we had, finding the people that wanted to be able to expand the footprint, understand what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. The whole thing is never have a gap in your backlog, backlog of work. In, in um, municipality work, if you didn't get project, you'd have a big gap. And you, you wouldn't have many billings for that month. And it really, you might be making money as a contractor, but those gaps are what kill you. So the consistency, and that's what also, it kills you as a contract, but it also kills the morale of the company because maybe you might have to dismiss somebody. Mm. My, my goal is everybody that comes in this Heffler company, I'm always looking at them as a, a long-term employee or a long-term team player that comes in that wants to end their career here. That's the way I look at it because, and that's why we have so much backlog and we have so much work coming in because our goal is to never have any gaps at all. Now, when you say the, um, to take care of the backlog and the gaps in the backlog, someone listening to this is going to say, well, yeah, you have 96 employees. It's easy to do today. How did you do that when you had five employees? Didn't, didn't, it's, you're right. It's very difficult. Um, what we found, we found out is, is I was subcontracting a lot of work at that time. That was helping a little bit as well. So, um, but now we're doing about 50% of the work in house. Um, the employees, yeah, it was gradual. 
it, it was gradual going from the, the let's say one employee to 96 but the but it's always we always looked at the model as being we have an office in Hesperia that replicates the model here in San Diego we have an office in Vandenberg that replicates the models throughout those areas so we build whatever we can manage we we go after it. if we can't manage we don't we don't go after it um, in this day and age, having 96 employees, it, it might be a little bit easier because the market's um, pretty viable, but you still have to manage. Oh, you, you still have you still have to have that culture. <laughs> That's that, a big payroll. That's yeah, a big payroll. <laughs> you, you, you still have to have that culture that wants to get these projects done. And I think that's a bigger challenge. That is, that's a challenge. Tell, tell us about that because, it, you know, I actually uh, posted something recently. Uh, and, and actually, I did a podcast earlier with a gentleman. And um, we said that people are our greatest, greatest assets, but they're also your greatest liabilities. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, it's, um, sometimes Jesse tells me I'm the liability. No, I'm just joking. Oh, that's, but, good. Uh, <laughs> that's good when you're the liability. <laughs> um, that's good. I like that. I'll be straight. I'll be straight with you. I, I'm just a leader. And the, the company is made up of great people. And they're the ones who made, make this company successful, not me. I just have the vision. I have the, the guts and the determination and the willingness to take risks. And um, they, they're enticed by that. And, and they like that. And um, as far as liabilities are concerned, I don't consider people a liability. Hmm. I consider the way I treat them or the way I approach a situation to, to, could be a, more of a liability. Hmm. If I if I'm not treating the person correctly, if I'm not doing doing what I say I'm going to do, then that's the problem. That's the that's the issue. Um, I very I'm very clear when I interview anyone that comes in the com into the company. I'm I'm not here to have you work on one particular project. I'm here to have you work the rest of your career here, your the rest of your rest of your uh, your your time here. And I go. But I'm going to try to do everything I can to make you make you have all the success in the world here. I'm going to give you everything you need, all the tools you have. There's never going to be an issue where it's my I'm the excuse for success. But it's up to you to do it. You need to live up, to, live up, and I will live up to my expectations as well. So that's the way I treat it. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. That's what I was going to say. I mean, you've had to have people that it didn't work out. There wasn't. A oh yeah. Yeah, and it's, sometimes it's not fit because um, they're just – uh, quite honestly, the only time it's really not a fit is when the, stricture, the strictures of our protocols are not what they're used to, mm -hmm. and it's tough for them to adapt to the strictures. It's usually not a personality or a, right. or a conflict. It's just um, maybe they're not as strong technology-wise or not, not used to doing it their way. Um, it's, that's, that's usually what it is. How do you deal with people that are not performing? Like an employee that's not, he, you know, he's, he has a certain uh, expectations that you guys have set for him, a roadmap, and he's not living up to that. First of all, I thought we, we, we find out why he's not. Okay. Is it Kefler? Is it us? Are we not providing him the resources, the training, um, the technology, the assets that he needs or she needs. If, if we find out that's not the issue, then we find out, Hey, what can we do? What you, you're, you're missing, missing, missing it a little bit. How can, how can we make it better for you? And sometimes, sometimes they're able to explain themselves and say, Hey, you know what? I'm just not used to how you guys do things. I understand why you do it, but I'm not used to it and I'm struggling. We've had people come in our company and, in one week, they know all the protocols. Then we've had people that are 30-year veterans in construction that takes them two to three months. So we give them the flexibility to learn. Um, but at that point, where there comes a time that we're business is business and say, you know what? I'm not living up to your expectations. You may not be living up to what we expected when we discussed everything. And um, let's just part ways for, for, for all the right reasons, amicably. And that's what happens quite honestly. And we, you got to have the, determine, the ability to do that. So that's a, that's um. look, the first thing that came to my mind is I'd work for you. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, no, no, that's some good stuff. No, no, listen, Patrick. I mean, that's some good. Man, that sounds like Starbucks, like Disney World type stuff, man. That's great. I just, I mean, I have never experienced that, right? I mean, I'm, you know, I've, and, and the workforce and people that I've experienced are like, you know, you know, ship up or shape out. You know, it's like, uh, I just, I, I, I love the approach and I think that that is the right way to do it and give people an opportunity and, and look at yourself because uh, we could have been the problem. But I just, again, a lot of these concepts, um, I haven't heard. And I think a lot of people will benefit from them. And, but we're in no way perfect. I'm going to tell you right now, we're always constantly changing. I'm a, I'm a firm believer on making 1% improvement weekly on everything. And I'm constantly trying to tr tweak things. Je I'm lucky I have Jesse because Jesse is the uh, type of guy that you, you want to go into battle with on every aspect. He, he's the thinker. He's the analytical side of every, a lot of things. I, I tell him, hey, this is my goal. This is what I'm trying to achieve. How can we do it? And he'll give me the right answer or the wrong answer. He's not a yes man. He just says, you know what, Pat, that's not going to work. This is the reason why. And um, he tells me what I want to hear sometimes, but he tells me a lot of times, probably most of the time, what I don't want to hear. And and one of the things is going into these um, capability presentations. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of a lot of your clients or your people you you, you work with, mm -hmm. they go into these capability presentations with a big old pot or a big old uh, PowerPoint and this and that. Just talk to the con con government. That's the key. They're real. These, these the people that are sitting across from you are real, right. and they they you just need to make them look good, and you and you need to. Um, see what, what they have, what their needs are and what they're trying to get. A lot of, a lot of contractors, a lot of contractors, or not, I'm not saying a lot of contractors, a lot of things I've told Jesse is that, that we need to go in there every time we talk to the government, like that we're sitting across listening to ourselves. Do you want to hear what this guy's telling you? Do you guys, do, can this guy be, uh, be a benefit to us? Can Patrick be a benefit? And that's, that's what we got to look at. And that's the one thing that when we go to these capability presentations, and I've probably done 200 of them, different agencies, some successful, some not. And, um, and the whole aspect of it is being real. And a lot of your, the guys you work with, they need to realize that they're, they don't need to try to impress people. They just need to impress upon them what you, what you are all about and how you can help them. And that's, that's what's important. Uh, uh, no, I, I like that. That was great. The concepts that you mentioned, the ideas, do they come from any place? Or they, they're, these are yours? Do they come from a book? Do they come from literature? Do they come from... No, you know what? I, I'll, I'm going to honestly say it's my dad. Okay. I'm, I, I, he didn't... He, he taught me a lot of things and and I think I used his influence and sort of made it my own and and tweaked it to be able to articulate it somehow to people because I know he was a very inspirational person and that I think a lot of people that come to work for Heffler they they they're coming here because they're inspired by what we're trying to achieve and and, and they want to be part of it and they want to belong they want a family and they, and they want to belong to it. And, and I think that I got that from my dad. I mean, he, he worked many years side by side from guys laboring to guys operating to, to guys that have master's degree. And he never treated them any different. Never. And he was real. And you could sense that. And uh, you could feel that from the guy. Um, and I think I try to tr try to do the best I can to, bring that into my company and in my life as much as I can. What kind of extracurricular activities are you into? I am a full fledged sports fanatic I, when it I, comes to my kids. <laughs> my kids are, man, your kids, I see them. They're all over Twitter, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love those guys. And, um, my son played football at Pomona Pitzer, uh, three years, almost a four year starter. Now he's, uh, that's a good example. I, I, he's not making a lot of money. I'll tell you, he's getting his master's degree at Concordia. Uh -huh. And, um, and I, I told him, Hey, don't, don't worry about the money. Just worry about what you love. Worry about your passion. And, and it, money will come later when you need it. Uh -huh. Don't worry about it. 
and he's doing exceptional. My daughter with Bama Network, it just took off. She had this great idea. She was sitting down. We're just sitting down drinking coffee with her mom and her. And he goes, what, why do you guys create? Because she, was, she went to Alabama from USD to get um, into journalism or to broadcast journalism and it's specifically sports. And they had to come up with a, a solution on how they can get trained and how they can get experience because everybody she was trying to intern with was, was asking, what experience do you have? And, um, and so she said, why don't we create with her really good friend why don't we create a podcast or a, let's say a YouTube, I don't even know what it's called anymore, but a YouTube um, that that's, has a college girl's basically um, standpoint on, um, on sports, mm. specifically Alabama sports. Which is huge. And it took off. It took Alabama off. sports is, first of all, it's huge. So, I mean, that- it, it, it absolutely took out. Uh, I, luckily, she has my, my wife's looks. And, and, and she, she, and she's got my wife's intelligence and, um, she, there, she's doing really well, extremely well. And now she's, um, getting the opportunities at, at certain networks to, um, to get internships. Her internship got canceled this last summer because of COVID. Um, she was disappointed with that, but it got deferred until after she graduates. So, um, she's a, a, a semester behind my oldest son. And but extracurricular activities, I, I love going to their games. I have never missed my son's football games. Never missed it, no matter where it's at. I'll fly there wherever, I'll fly by myself, whatever it is, I'll be there. And I I I, I told my son, I pro- you make if you play college football, I'll be at every single game no matter what. And I, I was. And um, my wife and I were. And um, now now my son, middle son, Connor, is gonna be playing for Cal Poly. And Division One, and he, he's he's a great guy and great kid, great smart kid. Again, takes after my wife in, in, in intelligence and grades. Um, but he he's going up in about a week to start um, optional training or a volunteer training up at Cal Poly. What position and, is he going to uh, play? He's a linebacker, middle linebacker, Mike linebacker. Yeah, he's a he's a mean guy. So <laughs> I think he takes after my dad. My dad. Um, and then, then we got my younger guy, who's a baseball player and a football player, and he's going to be going to St. Augustine as a freshman next year. This coming year, so I go to all their games, and that's how I get. I guess that's how I release my steam. Congratulations on your daughter on a podcast. I mean, I wish you all the best. I actually, yeah, you, you got to uh, check her out, Bama Network. I no, I listen. I already checked her out before. I I got I knew her before I knew you. <laughs> I mean, she tweets all the time, and, you know, it started off as Bama Girls, and then it went to Bama Network. Yeah, you know? that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, but no, I, you know, again, obviously, I'm a podcaster. I'm a YouTuber. Uh, so, you know, I resonate with things. And on top of that, I'm a Gator, so I'm an SEC guy, and oh, Alabama yeah. is SEC. Oh, so, yeah. she hits a lot of my hot button points, you know. Oh, I bet. Yeah, you know, we're, because I saw on one of your tweets, they tweeted um, – an athlete at a foot Florida football game was on your Twitter feed. It was an athlete yeah. chasing down a Clemson player. Oh, oh, that was a oh, that was awesome. Number ninety nine. Yeah, he yeah. Oh. he chased him. He yeah, ran. He got he in the a backfield. Motor. Got yeah, motor. exactly. That's right. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's funny because she, she she argues and and discusses the drafts with my sons and. They're big, big time um, in the sports, and and she she stands her ground. I can see that having an appeal with people, right? Because that's a different perspective. That's a whole nother. Yeah. I, I would like that because again, you're you're used to getting the typical like agent perspective on on sports, right? The ESPN yeah. stuff. But let's hear what some college students think about it. Exactly, and especially two girls. Yeah, two, two very right. smart, very right. smart beautiful young ladies who have a, a real strong knowledge in football. And no, sports. I saw them do a mock draft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, funny. it's really cool. No, I'm telling you like that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. To me. Of, she, they hit sort of a niche. Yeah, yeah. she did. She did. She did. No, I, I mean, look again, um, I, 
if there's no opportunities, right, you have to create your own path. So, right. you know, she, like you said, she was looking for a way to get herself some internships and opportunities. She just created her own path. Right. And I, and I honestly, I love technology and I love, you know, where we're at in the world to, to do that because again, you know, you were ahead of the curve and entering 18 persons. Right. But that's kind of what we do here at the podcast, right? Is we interview people, share their stories uh, and talk about what made them successful and how they got there because those lessons, right. Can be passed along to the next generation. Uh, the next right. small business guy coming up, um, you know, so let's fast forward to now we're 2020 it's COVID, right? The last time we had a recession, you, right. You had to sell off equipment every month. How are you doing this time? Well, this time I'm hiring quite honestly. Love it. I took a complete opposite approach and we hired five, five very good people to add to our team. We hired, we hired five people. Uh, we hired two estimators and three superintendents just recently, and um, we looked at it as, yeah, it's COVID, but let's let's look at this as an opportunity. There's some very successful people out there that we'd like to bring bring aboard our team, and this might be the opportunity to do so. And um, luckily, luckily they they were enticed by what we were able to offer, and we we engaged them, and now they're aboard. Um, as far as sales is concerned, we have, have, have had a drop off in sales, um, in revenue, but it's really just because of, of the fact that you, it's more difficult to get things done. That's right. Fair right. Value. Yeah. Right. Right. As far as the contracts are concerned, nothing changed there. Nothing changed. We're still getting awards, awarded contracts. We're still bidding. We have 12 estimators and they're, they're going nonstop. nonstop. Wow. Really? 12 estimators. So, yeah, they're just, well, they, they all have their specialty, quite honestly. We have an electrical estimator. We have a mechanical estimator, uh, wet and dry. We have two civil estimators and like three or four um, GC type estimators. And then Carl runs that, all runs them. You, you talked about uh, IDIQs, Chocks, Max. I mean, I, I looked at your website. Uh, I take it that you're on various vehicles? Yes. Um, we're on $157 million worth of jock contracts. Mm -hmm. And I think our programs, we have 12 programs that are max. And those 12 programs are anywhere from HVAC max to general construction max. And, um, our jocks, our jocks that were all, they're all competitive jocks that we, we went into and, um, they're all different locations. Some are in the desert area, some are in San Diego. Some are metro, which is all encompasses all the bases in San Diego. Some are up north. Um, our Mac, um, we just received a, a, a Mac, a nationwide roofing Mac. Um, so, and we're part of that group. And, and I'm sure you're aware of Macs are sort of like a select bidders list, basically what it is. The government isolates a certain amount of funding for these contractors to compete, uh, to go after. You have to demonstrate your ability and um, in, in your capabilities and your background and your uh, past performance. And then the next phase would be a pricing phase, so, um, which would, would be possibly a, a project that's either um, a seed project that you pr propose upon. And that's how the government evaluates you. And these contracts take, take about a year to get. Mm -hmm. And um, so some of these contracts we have, like I said, we have 12 of them right now. And they all vary in size, um, but they're all they all encompass pretty much all the bases and, and states that are um, like Arizona, Nevada, California, Washington, things of that nature. So, and then like I said, we just got our nationwide roofing back, which which we're excited about. Well, no, I love it. There's something on your website. It says Polka performance okay, Polka. oriented construction activity. I've never heard of that before. Basically, it's it, it's it comes from U.S. Ace, so you know uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Okay. And what it is, it's a contract vehicle that's designated similar to a, like a jock contract, mm -hmm. but what it is, it's a it's it's an isolated contract vehicle with the Army Corps of Engineer, and it's a sole source. What they do is they nego they negotiate your G and A only, 
And then each particular project that they, they issue off of it or task order, you negotiate the costs associated with that task order with exception to the GMA, which gets added to the contract. So for instance, the POCAs that we have are, um, are usually designed to, hello Heffler, we, we got a sole source for you, we're gonna use a POCA as the vehicle, we're gonna award you a $2 million POCA, that $2 million POCA is gonna cover this project, which is, let's say a run, uh, runway project at Edwards, and then it's gonna handle this tenant improvement that we need to be done at uh, Edwards as well. And so, a lot of times the POCA contracts are anywhere from like 500,000 to a million dollars, and um, but they can also be larger than that, but they, they're they not to exceed $2 million. We have had a, a $4 million POCA, but they don't do do that that often. A lot of the, a lot of the Army Corps of Engineers don't use POCAs with exception to LA District. LA District, LA, LA District uses the POCAs more often. Hmm. I've never heard of it. That's a good vehicle for any 8 day is to um, request POCAs, um, opportunity to prove themselves through a POCA contract. Very good opportunity for them. And LA District is the one that actually administers a lot of them, more than, more than the other districts. Why, why is it different than a regular sole source? It's just a vehicle. It's a vehicle. It's, so it's, not a, vehicle. it's not one particular contract. Ah, so they, they'll, they'll, okay, okay. It's not, one, it's not for one specific Sort of like a job, a bigger yeah, job. Yeah, okay. And, um, but the thing, instead of in a, on a jock, they, you, you submit your coefficient. On a POCA, you submit a GNA cost only or a GNA percentage, so you're not negotiating that at all in any aspect. You know, I uh, two years ago I went after a Jock Conklet in the um, New England area, and man, it was really st strange how to fill out the Jock forms. Uh, they recommended that you buy that software that they have. Uh, Four yeah. clicks or yeah, RS no, it's uh, yeah, RS means, but RS means has a jock version of it. Yes, um, we use four clicks. Use it's which one? It, it's called four clicks. Four clicks. Okay. Some other, some other people use Guardian, Guardian, and there's other ones as well. Yeah, because I mean, it was a first time for us, and I think that our estimate was just like overwhelmed. He thought he could whip it up in the last you know couple of days. <laughs> yeah, it's a cumbersome a program. RS means is very tough and tough in a sense that it takes so so long. If you're an estimator, if you know you're estimating, um, and and you if you watch if you look at RS means, each individual line item doesn't always encompass the complete scope of your activity that you're trying to perform. Right. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can lose a lot of money. You can lose a lot of money yeah. doing that. And, and uh, because it's very difficult to maneuver. Right. No, no I agree. I agree. No, I, I um, no, it was really difficult and end up not doing it just because, you know, they took it for granted, uh, the, the complexity of it. Yes. Right? Because most people think, Hey, it's just like any other bid, you know, we're going to put together, we're going to estimate the job. And again, the seed product was very simple in nature. Yes. Right. <laughs> so like, Oh, yes. this is, you know, I could put this on a back burner and, and work on it later. And then, Turn no. out to be a case. Definitely, um, I'll, I'll tell you right now, the jock programs that we're in are take a lot more um, horsepower to get them going on an individual task order process mm -hmm. because a lot of times they, the scope is undefined or it's a very limited um, def, def, defined scope. And so you have to go in that out there and partner with the, the client or the end user or the government and say, okay, this is what needs to be done this is what's lacking in your scope. Let's joint scope this project and partner with them. That's what the government wants. The government, in my opinion, has, has limited resources of people that understand the POCA process or the um, job con process. It's supposed to be a job oriented contract, mm -hmm. but it's supposed to be a fast job. Is they're supposed to be able to get through the contract, get it done as quickly as possible without going through the procurement process of SAM.gov. Right. That's the whole point of it. Right. It's, it's a quick vehicle. And if you don't know the process from start to finish, it takes, 
it, it, it takes a lot of time. And I, in my opinion, it takes more time to do a job task order sometimes if you do it correctly than it does to bid a Mac task order, hmm. in my opinion. Let me ask you this. I noticed that recently you won uh, some full and open competition jobs, right? Yeah. What do you think or give me your take on a sole source versus full and open competition from the standpoint of, uh, like you said just earlier, you talked about horsepower, the amount of work that goes into it. A lot of people presume or assume that sole source is easier. It's the low hanging fruit. I have a now, opinion, but I'm going to hear what you have to say, and then I'll give my t two cents. I'm going to be straight with you, Eric. I, we never go after sole source. We, it just comes to us. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean it arrogantly. I mean that it, there's a lot of work involved with sole source. Yeah. Because, and, and there's a lot of negotiating going on with right. sole source. Right. Because right. They're, they're really trying to hammer you for the right reason, I guess, in a lot of, in a lot of aspects. But... They're, they're Can you explain that to everybody, well, what that means? Because I don't think a lot of people have experienced that. I, I know exactly what you mean, but yeah. can you further elaborate? Well, what we've experienced is a lot of these contracts, the government has great ideas about this particular project. But a lot of the projects that they have these great ideas about, their budgets are three to four, five, six years old. Mm. So they're using older numbers, and they're trying to build that project using older numbers into a, a, a current pricing project. Or to mm -hmm. current pricing proposal. And what they have to realize is a lot of the Davis bacon wages create uh, increased. A lot of a lot of materials are more costly. The logistics are associated with that more costly. And you and you have to sort of tell that story to the government and sort of bring them for to to reality on a lot of things, respectfully, obviously. Um, so a lot of times the projects they might have an intent of a project being two or three million dollars to say. But in reality, it's a four million dollar project all day long. Not, but honestly, it correctly, right? right. And because of the increases in and escalation in material and labor costs, and location wherever the logistics are, and so when it comes to a lot of those sole sources, what we found is a lot of those projects have a lot of downscoping in their original intent. Mm. We're going to have to create. We have to give try to give them the best value for the money. Uh, but we might have to downscope it. And we'll go through six or seven negotiations on that particular project mm -hmm. to get it within the, the guidelines of their, their, um, their strictures of their funding. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, but it, in, in, in addition to that, it's multiple job walks, multiple discussions, multiple showing them the story, showing them the true reality, and having somebody on the other end have a common sense and realize, you, you know what, Heffler's making a good point. This is what we need. This is, we bid this thing, we brought our, uh, we created our budget three or four years ago. This is what, what it was then, this is what it is now, just based on same scope. So it takes a lot of work. Um, the, the, the key to, in my opinion, to the sole sources is uh, filling out your sources sock. Mm -hmm. That's the key. A lot of your the people that you work with, they should be filling out sources side all day long. Right. That's right. the way they market their company. That is the key because those sources sock create opportunity, and it might not be the contracting officer, it might not be the one that that particular project they use you on, but they'll call you on about another project they know based upon your sources sock response. Mm -hmm. And the sources spot, as you know, is is just a market research for the government. It's their way of marketing contractors. And um, a lot of our projects are based on those sorts of sites you know, that we've submitted. I might have submitted one two years ago, and it was just a mark, market research two years ago. The funding wasn't available then. And they come around the corner, and, and they say, hey, are you still interested in that, this particular project? And um, that is, for an 8A, uh, um, if they submit their sources of and spend the time to do that, that's a huge benefit. And if I, I wish I would have known that early on because it, it really yielded a lot of good, good contacts for us. And, but like I said, the sources side is a way we market quite honestly, our company. And, um, 
when it comes to the sole sources, like I said, it's, 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 they're, they're, they're tough. They're tough. They're tough to deal with. Um, but if, if you get a, a, a contract on this, on the, on the, um, sole source, you need to perform. You need to give them what they're asking for in every aspect, management, quality, schedule, everything. And that will, should yield more opportunities in, your, to the, in the future. I, um, we actually, about three weeks ago, the SBA 7J training, we, um, I led a proposal writing class and we talked about the benefits of source of thoughts and RFIs to eight days. Yeah. And the sources, the sources side is huge. No, it's huge. And I showed examples where exactly what you said, uh, we had responded to a source of thought back in 2018. And then we responded again in 2019 to the same person. And then 2020, you get a phone call with an opportunity. Um, yeah. And it's, you, just, it's, you don't know where it comes from. It just comes out of the blue one day. And the next thing you know, Hey, I have something. Are you interested? You, you know what? Um, the government, they don't, well, a lot of the, people that we work for, contracting officers, specialists, whatever they may be, they don't want to have a lot of time. They don't have a lot of resources and a lot of time to deal with things. And, but you got to find every opportunity to contact them. Any excuse. Any excuse to contact them. So it might have been a source of thought that you're mentioning, 2018. That could be an excuse to follow up with them with a phone call or an email six months later. Right. And they'll respectfully answer you. Right. And that's the great thing about it. And if I would have known about the source of sight and put more emphasis, because it is a lot of horsepower to do it. You, you got you to gotta answer their questions and provide capabilities and all that. Um, but sometimes you got to realize that maybe you're not 100% qualified or let's say you don't have a lot of projects that have that specific, specific scope. But that contracting officer and or specialist manages multiple projects, not just that one. You might not be qualified for that one, and they'll tell you, hey, you don't meet the qualifications, but I have this other one in um, San Antonio. What do you thought? What's your thoughts? So that's what, what ends up happening. One, one door closes, another one opens. Wow. Wow. Patrick, I've, um, I've, I've gone past my time. I, I, I want to be respectful of you. You know, t talk to, tell the small businesses out here, like, you know, some parting words, um, things that, Again, like I said, if you want to give a message from your father, some advice that stuck with you. I know sometimes it's difficult for people to imagine, um, you know, say, hey, well, I'm not like Patrick because he's at 96 employees. But at, at some point, you know, you stuck it out. You stayed with it. You didn't change lanes. You didn't give up. Right. And you started over again. And that story is a lot like my story, which everyone in the audience has already knows my story. But um, I got into government contracts in 2007, right? Right before the market took a took crash. And I saw people like yourself that prior to this recession had been tremendously successful. And I looked up to them, I respected them, I admired them. And when the market crashed, they crashed with it. And meanwhile, I was new to construction, new to the business world in terms of that industry. And we were having tremendous success just because we were in a different market, not because I was smarter, or more ambitious, we just operate in a different marketplace. And that's why I just tout the power of federal contracting and I teach it and I, and I want to get the word out to as many people as possible because it does have a, a way of changing your trajectory, right? In life. Yes. Um, and I have three of my closest friends that we communicate on a regular basis. Um, we all do federal contracting and it's, it's, been a great blessing to us and our families and um you know i, I don't know I can't, I can't have enough good words to say about it so no, I, I agree i i enjoy it as well so, i enjoy it as well um uh, just some you know final words that you'd like to share with everyone out there to, to leave them with uh, a message well I, I think it's an opportunity and i think you need to treat that opportunity like like your child in every aspect um, your, chi your child's only going to be here for so long. So you want to instill in them and build with them some lasting memories. And uh, you want to do everything you can to help that, to put, put that child in the right direction. The 8A program is something that's, that's an opportunity for many. And if you use that opportunity to its fullest, you can be completely successful. But you have to be dedicated. And you have to realize that it's, it, it's, 
it's not only an opportunity that could help you advance your career, but it can advance everybody else's career with you, your company, your, your everybody associated with you. So what I, what I instill with everyone on your podcast is, is remember where you came from and remember that any difficulty you may have within the 8A program, it's, it's just a difficulty. It's not an obstacle. And it's something that you can just get through. And get, getting through that difficult is going to make you stronger in the, in the, in the, in the program. And um, it has made me stronger. My difficulties in 2007, 2008 made, made me a stronger person and made me, um, gave me the focus on what I needed to achieve. And if um, I look at my dad now from, from above, or my dad's looking at me, I guess you can say, and I, I, I think he would be happy with what we've, we're doing for people, for people. Not for me, for people. And realize that your companies, this company, Heffler Company, is, is, is everybody's. It's not just mine. So I, I, I enjoy it. I really do. And I have a passion for, uh, for contracting. I really do. No, that's, that's amazing. One thing I did forget to mention or ask, do you use uh, Deltec or GovWin or GovTribe, any of those software tools? I, I, did, Del- I did try Deltec a while back, okay. probably three, four years ago. Okay. And I didn't need it, quite okay. honestly. And, and um, I found that my, the best work that came, where, where I came out of was, um, was just Sam. Dot right. gov and just finding the resources myself. It does take a lot of time, but I, that's, that's my job to find, find um, opportunities and, um, and word of mouth and capability presentations and getting our, our company's name out there. That's, that's what worked more for us. Okay. No, no, good, good stuff. I was just kind of thinking of that in my brain. No, yeah. well, th- thank you, Patrick. This has been wonderful. Thanks for agreeing right. to come on today, taking out the time thank on you. your Monday, just after the holidays.